During the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been inviting local medical professionals here to five, Channel 5 to answer your questions about the outbreak via video chat. All you have to do to ask your question is text it to us to the number there on your screen. That's 479-785-5055. Today, we are joined by Dr. Sonal Bakta. She is the Vice President of Medical Affairs for Mercy Hospital. Doctor, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Good afternoon. Yesterday, we reported a story from 5 News reporter Allie Lynch telling us about a Mercy COVID-19 patient who had been on a ventilator, on life support. He has now recovered from the virus and is home with his family. Can you tell us a little bit more about him and does his story give hope to our community? Sure, sure. So first of all, uh, we do take HIPAA very seriously. I want everybody to know that we would not be speaking about this patient had he not given us permission to speak about his care. Um, he was admitted to our facility on uh, March 24th. Um, he was discharged uh, April 6th. He was on the ventilator for seven days. Um, he was very critically ill, um, but he is overall doing very well. It does give everybody involved in his care and in our everybody in our facility hope that these patients do you have the capacity to do very well, um, even when critically ill? So yes, definitely. Yeah, that's amazing news to hear. Uh, we know his family, obviously very grateful. Uh, what have they had to say to you guys about his treatment? Well, I'm gonna read you a little note that his significant other I wrote to our, our hospital staff. The nurses, doctors, and hospital staff, you put your safety on the line to care for your patients. Thank you. When I called nurses are friendly, professional and very helpful. The doctors have realized how deficient it is not being able to see him and make it a priority to call with updates. B's room was filled with angels, those sent by prayer and those who have uh, worked tirelessly to help us. You cannot hear it enough. Your dedication is amazing and you truly are heroes and angels. My staff is amazing. Um, the doctors and the nurses and the respiratory therapists and the phlebotomists, everybody. Everybody did such a phenomenal job, and they continue to do such a phenomenal job. I'm so proud of them. Yeah, it's emotional to hear <laughs> words like that, right? And I'm sure it, it does your heart good to hear those words from someone who survived this virus. Sure, it definitely does. I sent it to the entire staff, anybody who'd listen. Yeah. <laughs> I sent them that note because it is such a touching note. For sure. So not specifically about this patient, but what have you learned about COVID-19 patients in, in general through this process of treating them over the last weeks and months? Sure, I'm learning from the people that are actually in the COVID unit, um, my excellent physician partners and uh, nursing staff. Um, we are noticing that they do require prolonged time on the ventilator compared to other disease processes. Um, they do develop um, a disease called uh, acute respiratory d uh, distress syndrome, ARDS, um, which is causing them to stay on the ventilator for a prolonged period of time. Um, they do get sick pretty quickly when they get sick, um, but a majority are doing very well and never get critically sick. Um, the other thing that we're learning, which is really interesting, is normally when patients are on ventilators, they require sedation to tolerate being on the ventilator. They are requiring a larger amount of sedation. Um, I don't know why, but it is an interesting fact. <laughs> yeah. So, but otherwise, they're doing really well. For those who are on ventilators, so then does it appear that when they're put on that ventilator, they seem to get worse before they get better? It is not only uh, a good news once they're on a ventilator. Is that right? Um, well, they get worse and then they get put on the ventilator is kind of what's happening. And then they get better while on the ventilator. Um, and it's just taking a while to really get them off. Um, their oxygenation gets better. Their oxygen needs um but I think the sedation part is a little challenging, so. And I'm sure that can be challenging too for their caregivers and their families and friends who are concerned about their well-being and then can't be there with them, right? Yes, yes, it's incredibly uh, difficult. We are developing um, better ways. We're looking into better ways of using technology to where patients can uh, or their family members can see their patients, uh, the patients in the uh, hospital. Um, and we're also developing a program, a patient advocate program, where we'll have an advocate located on each unit to where their sole focus will be communication with um, family members to make sure that they feel that, that they have all the knowledge that they need and that sort of thing. So we are working on that process. 
That's great progress and definitely good news <laughs> about the patient who's recovered. Thank you so much for answering those questions. We'll have much more for you coming up after this break. First, though, let's get a check of your forecast. Well, once again, we are joined by Dr. Sonal Bakta. She is the Vice President of Medical Affairs for Mercy Hospital, taking your questions about COVID-19. Uh, doctor, we heard that the CDC obviously has come out with new guidance for wearing masks, advising people to wear those cloth masks while in public. Is that something that Mercy's stance has changed on or evolved on as well? Sure. We, uh, we are also advising people to wear cloth masks out in public. Um, in our hospital, where we are um, taking donations for cloth masks, and we are asking our coworkers that are non-patient facing to wear those cloth masks. So yes, we have changed our stance on it. That's great to hear. I know uh, the CDC also mentioned that for young children, those under two, that they shouldn't wear masks. Uh, can you explain why that is and, and what the risk could be to like a young child or a toddler that would be wearing a mask? Well, I. I don't know that the mask necessarily fits properly on young children. Um, and I imagine that there's probably a safety risk there as well um, in terms of, you know, um, like a suffocation or, you know, some, some ill type effect on small children. So. Gotcha. So safer to not use one than to use one and it be potentially used incorrectly. I'm sorry, you just cut out. Can you say that one more time? Just making sure that it's uh, you don't want to use it incorrectly, that there's more potential danger from that than using one at all. That's correct. That's correct. We know you're also studying the projections about the peak of this virus. So what can you tell us about what you've learned on that? Sure. Good evening. You use my favorite projection, which is the COVID19.healthdata.org. Um, so it, our peak is projected to be April 25th as of right now. Um, I do enjoy this projection. It does show that we in the state of Arkansas will not have a bed or ICU bed shortage, which I love to hear. <laughs> um, and I think is very, very hopeful. But we're still just, we're very prepared. So April 25th is the, uh, the date of the peak is what I believe. So. Obviously, that can fluctuate because new data is always coming in and those are the, the projections are being adjusted. But do you feel like at this point that indicates that social distancing is working and that, that we're all doing our job to help flatten the curve? Absolutely. Uh, social distancing is absolutely working. And we can definitely see that. We're, we can see that we are flattening the curve here in Arkansas, which is very encouraging. So I just continue everybody to continue uh, continue social distancing, um, especially with this upcoming Easter week. Technology to see your friends and family when possible. I know we're having a few technical glitches, but we are still able to get your answers, so that's definitely good news. I know there's been a lot of cooperation and communication okay. between the area health systems with preparation. Do you feel like collectively uh, that you are ready for a possible surge in cases if that happens? We are absolutely ready. We've had ongoing uh, phone calls and meetings with uh, Northwest Medical Center and with Washington Regional to look at our bed capacity and our capabilities and our current PPE um, supplies and that sort of thing. Um, we are absolutely as ready as we can be. All right, that's great news to hear. We'll have more questions for you coming up after this break. Don't go anywhere. Dr. Sonal Bakta, the Vice President of Medical Affairs for Mercy Hospital, has been with us this afternoon answering your questions about the COVID-19 pandemic. Doctor, we have a little bit of extra time, so we have a few more questions to ask you. We got this question from Jillian saying, where are we, th we with antibody screening so you can find out if you've already had COVID-19? Do you know anything about that? Um, yes. So I believe yesterday uh, the first FDA-approved antibody test came out. Um, we do not have local availability for that, but I do know that the health department is collaborating with the major healthcare systems in the state um, regarding convalescent plasma, and that will require antibody testing. Um, I, I believe we'll have a lot more information in the next week or so um, regarding antibiotic testing. There are a lot of home kits um, that are available right now. I'm not sure regarding the validity and reliability of those tests, sure. um, but more to come in, and probably a week we'll probably have some more information. Okay, good news. We also got this question saying, I've been taking hydroxychloroquine for a year. Will that help me or hurt me during this COVID-19 pandemic? One, can you tell people what hydroxychloroquine is and then answer this viewer's question if possible, please? Sure. It's, it's a medication we normally use for autoimmune diseases such as uh, lupus and that sort of thing. 
Um, we don't know the answer to that in short. Um, the dosing is a little bit different when we use it for critically ill patients um, with COVID-19. So um, it does have some antiviral properties at a at baseline, but it does, uh, I mean, I, I can't imagine it doesn't help, um, but we can't guarantee that it's gonna prevent um, prevent you from having COVID-19. Sure. We've gotten a lot of questions from different viewers asking about their risk factors and does uh, this put them at a higher risk of giving COVID-19? We got this question saying, am I at a higher risk for coronavirus? I am 72 years old with a slight heart murmur and I take medication to control high blood pressure. When people have these different ailments, how do you assess their risk for this virus? Well, that would be a high, a high risk category. Um, the highest risk categories are 65 and older, anybody with comorbidities, um, as well as immunosuppressed um, people with, you know, with autoimmune diseases, with cancer, undergoing treatment, and that sort of thing. So, yes, that would put that patient in a high-risk category. What are the biggest questions that you have been getting from patients uh, throughout this process, and how have those questions evolved over the last month or so as we've been dealing with this pandemic here in Arkansas? Sure. I think a lot of people ask me, um, does hydroxychloroquine work? I think a lot of people feel like um, that is prescribed as soon as the diagnosis is given, and that's, that's not the case. Um, we reserve that for our critically ill patients. Um, and have, have uh, definite algorithms and criteria for administering that drug, if not without risk. Um, the other most common question I get asked is, how long do you think this is going to last? <laughs> I think, uh, you know, everybody, we, uh, we all wonder. I don't know the answer to that. Um, like I said, we are flattening the curve, so I hope sooner than later, but um, there are also projections that we will see another round of this in the fall and winter. Um, we just don't know. So many uncertainties. What's the best thing that someone can do for themselves in this moment to keep them safe despite all of those uncertainties? Uh, social distance and wash your hands. Wash your hands. Um, be a little bit obsessive compulsive about washing your hands. <laughs> Every time you think of it, definitely do that. All right, good advice. Thank you so much. We'll leave you with your final thoughts after this break.